our City Services Committee meeting. Uh, welcome councillors, uh, GM and staff. Uh, I declare meeting um, of the 6th of April 2022 City Service Committee open at, I think it's 6.40. Uh, members of the public that have registered to speak by audiovisual link on the agenda item are asked to keep your microphones muted and video off until I invite you to speak. Speakers will not be able to present material as part of their speaking time or share their screen. Everyone at this meeting is reminded to conduct themselves in a polite and professional manner, keep communication factual, use appropriate language and tone. Do not use any defamatory or degradatory remarks. I also ask Council to observe the requirements under the Code of Meeting Practice and meeting etiquette included. Debate on an item will commence only uh, once we have a mover and a seconder for the item. The mover of the recommendation or motion has first the right to speak on the item. The mover has a right of reply before recommendation motion is put to a vote. Raise your hand to indicate you wish to speak as I will determine speaking order based on the hands I see then. Please indicate whether you are speaking for or against the item. You can speak up to five minutes on a motion and a similar time for any amendment. Uh, for the efficient conduct of this meeting, it is not necessary for you to repeat the matters you agree with and raise by any previous speaker. It is sufficient for you to say that you agree with the points raised. I also remind you that the video record is an official record of council and may be made available to persons on request in accordance with the Government Information Public Access Act uh, 2009. No other recordings are permitted. Um, Acknowledgement of country. Bayside Council respects the traditional custodians of the land, elders past, present, on which we meet, takes, <coughs> on which this meeting takes place, and acknowledge the Gadigal and Bidjigal clans of the Sydney Basin. Now, uh, apologies. Do we have any apologies, councillors? Uh, councillor Saranowski is an apology. And I think Councillor Michael Naji is running late, from what I understand. Um, now, we have received uh, only from uh, Councillor Saronowski, any others? No? Okay. Uh, right. Would someone like to move and second the apologies? Moved by Councillor Cedric, so I said, uh, Jason, thank you. Uh, all in favour say aye. Aye. And declare carried. Okay. Would someone mo like to move a... Um, actually, I'll see. Um, okay. What are we doing next? Disclosure of interest, councillors. I remind councillors that you should also notify the general manager in advance of the meeting of any disclosure of interest so that the Minute Secretary can prepare them on the screen. Any disclosures of interest must also be made at the meeting. So, councillors, any disclosure of interests? No disclosure? Um, Councillor Cedra? Yes, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, I'd like to, non-procunary, non-significant, um, that I've had associations in the past with um, Rockdale City Raiders in regards to item uh, CS220303, uh, the Bayside Community Grants, as well as Rockdale Illidan. Um, and I think that's it, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Just, uh, that's it. Not significant. So I'll remain in the, in the, com in the um, discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, councillors, uh, the disclosures will be, if there's no other disclosures, the disclosures will be noted in the minutes. Uh, okay. Uh, confirmation of minutes of previous meeting. Uh, this is the first one for the uh, City Services Committee, so there will be none. Uh, 
Okay, next we will... Um, Okay, I will now proceed to deal with the remainder of the business on the paper by exception. I, actually, we're not doing anything by exception tonight. So next we'll identify the items Council wish to speak on. Are there any other items you wish to pull out? And that would probably be um, if we do them by exception. My apologies, it's just uh, I haven't... <laughs> I'm not used to this, so... Um, okay. Uh, now, what's next on here? Public forum. Uh, public forum. Members of the public who have applied to speak at the meeting are now invited to address the meeting. Speakers are advised that a warning bell will sound when one minute of speaking time remains. We have one speaker tonight speaking on item CS22.006. Now, report item... Uh, that's uh, under number seven report CS22006. Now, uh, I would invite Mr. Matish. Is Mr. Matish online? He's online. online, okay. Uh, Mr. Yes. Matish, Hi, yeah. uh, please go ahead. Thank you, Chancellor. Good evening, uh, everyone. I wanted to use this opportunity just to provide my support for the officers' recommendation to progress further work on getting. Uh, additional off leash dog areas within the Bayside LGA. And I also wanted to suggest that the Riverine Park option in Art Cliff be reassessed as one of the potential off leash sites. Uh, as a bit, bit of a quick bit of background, my wife and I have been residents in Art Cliff for several years now, and we do have an 18 month old Labradoodle who brings a lot of joy to our lives. And at the moment, the nearest off leash dog park is approximately 20, a 25 minute walk. Uh, away from us being at the Cahay Hill uh, Park in Walleye Creek, which is a fairly unpleasant walk as we have to go through the, the busy M5 intersection uh, between Marsh Street and West Botany Road to get there, and I assume this will be the case for other Uncliff or Banksia residents. Um, and I think as a some broader context, if you keep in mind, I think it's important to recognise that pet ownership has increased in our communities, particularly uh, in recent years through COVID. <coughs> Um, and a report published in August last year by an industry body, Animals Medicines Australia, estimates that nationally 69% 69, 69 of households now own a pet, which is up from 61% in 2019 before the pandemic. And this increase has been led by a surge in dog ownership. And I think it's widely recognised the mental health benefits that all pets, not just dogs, provide to individuals, um, particularly during COVID lockdowns. and my dog has certainly provided that support to me over the past 18 months, and I've heard many similar stories from other dog owners. Um, so I think there is an obligation on the council to ensure that pet owners, uh, specifically dogs in this instance, have suitable access to off-leash areas to allow us to look after our dogs' mental and physical well-being. So look, overall, I'm very supportive of the initiative to look at a range of additional off-leash sites. However, I did want the council and the responsible officers to revisit the Riverine Park in Artcliffe, which was ruled out because it is currently classified as a, as a sporting field. Uh, but I understand that recreation areas can become dog accessible with the council's determination. And I appreciate that the Riverine Park area is quite a largely defined area. So to, to be very clear, the area that I'm specifically referring to is the field that is directly alongside West Botany Road, uh, next to where the COVID testing occurs. And I strongly believe that this uh, particular area would be an appropriate off-leash dog park with council's discretion. Uh, and it is, it is a park that I visit daily, maybe twice a day when the sun's out. Uh, and I rarely see that park uh, as being used for any organised sporting activity. Uh, in fact, the majority of the time, that park is used by dog owners to exercise their dogs. And I'd also highlight that there are currently plans in place to redevelop a nearby park, park area that will see the construction of four or five new sporting fields. And there is already six existing unused sporting fields behind the Barton Park driving range that is severely underutilised. So look, that's a total of 10 sporting fields that will become available in that area. Uh, and so with that context in mind and recognising that the Riverine Park uh, that I'm referring to is already, already uh, most frequently used as a dog exercise area. 
uh, and the fact that it's located sufficiently away from any resident, residential properties, it's got good existing infrastructure, including parking, drinking water supply, and two sides of fencing that's already in place. I would recommend that this option be reassessed by the by the officers, and I would also like to extend that I'm happy to volunteer my own time and support as required uh, by anyone to sort of progress this um, further. So. Thank you for the opportunity to share my views uh, with you all tonight. Uh, thank you, Mr. Desh, for uh, joining us tonight. Um, uh, Councillors, uh, we've got an officer's recommendation before us. Uh, moved by Councillor Morrissey, uh, second by Councillor Jansen. Thank you. Uh, any discussion, Councillors? Uh, through you, um, Mr. Chair, can I ask uh, the responsible officer as to um, why, based on the um, speaker's um, input tonight, that that field um, is excluded. That particular space is um, utilised <coughs> and has <coughs> a project that is being reviewed by council at the moment to expand its sport use. I would suggest that the location that the uh, speaker was referring to, to the, would be the west of that site could be utilised, so Firmstone Park, so um, in speaking of Riverine, I'm specifically referring to the sporting area, but there is uh, an existing park space there. If there was a site that was located far enough away from the existing playground, we would be able to likely accommodate that request. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Seto. Can I uh, first of all thank the speaker um, as well as the staff for preparing this. Um, Council's come a long way in regards to off-leash parks and I think this is a great initiative looking at every single ward. Um, I echo those sentiments from our staff in, in looking at some of those locations. Um, Mr Chair, if I could also add um, as well to some of those sentiments uh, that the speaker mentioned, um, there is a park also, and maybe if we could highlight this in future um, pr uh, planning, there is a park, for example, in Ward 5, which has a, a pool fencing, Bono Park, Bono Park, um, which oh, it's on Ritchie Street, San Susie. And I think if we can just, um, and this is to the staff, through you, Mr Chair, um, the concerns that have been in the past that if you've got a, a smaller kind of dog or a, or a, a puppy, um, and I've seen this myself, these dogs go through those pool fences. Um, so it's good for the bigger sized dogs and medium sized dogs. However, those little small ones will struggle to be contained in those areas. I know we're not only looking at fenced off areas, we're looking at the whole gamut of things. So if I can just ask through you, Mr Chair, if we can put that in our planning going forward, if we're looking at future sites and future uh, provisions, that uh, the bottom of the pool fence, uh, maybe 500 mil high or, or whatever, um, has a, a more closed uh, fencing structure so that it doesn't allow those puppies to escape. Yeah. yeah, the spacing, yeah. So, how long do you get the sentiment? Uh, thank you, Councillor Cedro. Uh, any other comments? Uh, Councillor Massa. Uh, through you, um, uh, Chair. Um, I just want to know, with the park at the Riverine Park, what is the spacing between the fields and looking at the area that you have said could be a possibility? Um, because I know that with... Yes, there is. So there would be enough space there to um, uphold a 10 metre distance, which doesn't sound like a lot, but what we could look at doing as well is introducing some vegetation to kind of um, create some soft boundaries there as well to show a clear sort of deviation between the playground and the intended use there and then the dog park on the other side of that. Just uh, two parks that were left off that, and I know we, we looked at this in the last term of council, was Boralee Park and Garnet Jackson. 
and um, sure. if we can just get a report back to the next committee, it's not urgent, just uh, using, using the same uh, criteria, if those parts could please be uh, tabled at the next committee meeting. Um, I know they were excluded for, for some reasons at the time, but now there's a clear criteria and we've, we've matured um, our, our appetite. If we can just have a look at whether they're eligible or fit uh, for that or not. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, sorry, uh, Councillor Warner. Thank you. Um, I've also got some questions um, through the chair. Um, I've noticed that Natai Place Reserve is, also, is actually on this list, and if the, that field at Riverine Park is also a possibility, then uh, would it um, maybe be an idea to have one for big dogs and one for small dogs, because they're fairly close to each other, um, because that can also be something that, that um, really helps dog owners if there's that separation. Yeah, yes, I would suggest that the park that you've um, identified is a smaller space and could potentially be used for your smaller dogs, like you've suggested, yeah. Um, and I've also got another question. Um, I've uh, had quite a few residents... Oh, actually, do I need to turn on the microphone? No, the um, councillors are their only speakers, unfortunately. Oh. Um, Um, yeah, so the other question through the chair, uh, please, is um, with, um, I've had a few residents around Gardner Park uh, contact me about, there's been a lot of rangers and a lot of dog owners have been approached and, and um, some people who walk their dogs in Gardner Park have felt... Um, you know, have felt a little bit harassed by the rangers, and so now um, they they have suggested, what about um, having an actual you know dog area, a, spe a specific dog area in Gardner Park? Um, there's a there's a clearing, sort of like a um, grass area above the sports field, so it's quite it's probably. Um, more than 20 metres away, from, and it's also at a different height than, than the, the sports fields. Um, so people suggested, what about having that area as a fenced or unfenced, you know, preferably fenced, probably off-leash area um, for dogs? So just wondering if that was a possibility. Perhaps utilising the same principles that we would apply for um, Garner Jackson and... Um, other facilities that may have nearby sporting facilities that that could be potentially included within the report back um, and, and then the, that way there's an assessment on all the sites so we've identified with those same principles. Thank you. Well, through you Mr Chair, uh, Councillor Cedra. Um, look, I, I know this is quite a sensitive issue but I think um, Councillor Musket said it clearly a little bit earlier on We've got to be really careful when it comes to... We, we went from minimal to one or two dog parks and now we're looking at many. We need to be very careful where there is sporting teams, playgrounds, kids. Um, a lot of these sporting teams, yes, they might have one field they're playing on, but they're also training on neighbouring grass patches. So I think we need to be really, really careful... If it's crucial and we can't find any other site, then let's consider it. But I am totally opposed to having potential danger, especially we've seen this in the past where councils can potentially be liable to some of these actions. If there's a playground, if there's a sporting field, we've got to be really careful. Thank you, Mr. Thank, thank you, Councillor Councillor Nardjum. Residents who have 
obviously, uh, there's been a few incidents in Gardner Park, and I concur with Councillor Cedric that you can't <coughs> have off-leash right next door to sporting facilities, right next door to playground, kids or whatever. I've always been not anti off leash dog, but I've always said that if we are going to consider further that we need to have a safety <coughs> fence around uh, whatever park that we decide in the future to go further off leash. One, for safety issues. And safety is paramount. Now, I'm not, uh, maybe the director of compliance, we ask the same question again and again. There's been many attacks, uh, dogs on dogs. I've got emails in Walleye Creek, in Car Park, where there's off-leash dogs, where there's been uncontrolled, they can't control their dogs. So what we really, we need to look at, at a place where it's a safe environment and have a safe defence, and I'm all for it. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> thank you, Councillor Naji. Look, I'm uh, mindful of the time, so, uh, yeah, Councillor, uh, you can uh, Sorry, yeah, over. just a quick reply. Um, I didn't mean to say that the rangers were harassing people. It was just people felt like they, they were being harassed. I just want to thank council staff for putting this together. Um, I know the residents in Ward 5 are very excited about the dog park proposed for Riverside Drive. That's been a high demand, so thank you on their behalf. Um, I did get some feedback that some of the community wish there'd been some public consultation around this process, so I don't know if that's something that we can take on board. Are we going to take this to public consultation is a question. I just wanted to also mention a couple of other things from the residents. Um, Natai Reserve, I think is how you say it. Um, I've been told, and I know it floods, it's very wet. Um, the resident that approached me said that she didn't think it was actually suitable, and I know that was something that was mentioned about Robertson Street uh, Reserve in Cogra. Um, but the main thing that I repeatedly got asked is if we could actually have some small, more small dog parks. Apparently there is um, a small dog park at Tempe near the old Jets, uh, club there and it's very popular and there's been a, a repeated pattern of people saying to me that their small dogs get attacked by larger dogs so there is a real demand for small dog parks uh, across the whole of Bayside. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you uh, Councillor Douglas. Look, um, that, uh, that's our discussion with the mover. I have a right of reply, Councillor. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I need to say, yeah, that um, my, my my guidance wouldn't would be to not spend too much time on big dog parks and small dog parks. Some small dogs are absolute terriers and will attack big dogs. Um, and then we have, like across a number of issues in Bayside, we've got a compliance and enforcement issue that that gives rise to who classifies a big dog, who classifies a small dog. Um, I understand the reasons behind it. Um, my I've got small and big dog. Um, the big dog gets attacked by small dogs. So if I put, you know, but I, what do you do? So I don't want to create another compliance issue and a whole other issue. And we're trying to do the right thing by uh, the community who's requesting. We know there's a need and an appetite for more dog parks. The council as a body now has a bigger appetite. But I don't want that to lead to another issue of big versus small. A classic example is the recent extension in Sir Joseph Banks Park, which is absolutely fam fabulous. Um, and there, there was a lot of discussion from residents about, um, well, let's put a fence down the middle of it and then this whole debate arise around well, what's big and what's small and who's going to say that. So we're going to actually potentially have residents like this at each other because my dog's bigger than yours and you can't be in here and all that sort of stuff. And then we'll talk about rangers visiting parks, you know. So um, just I, I wouldn't want uh, officers to spend too much time on that. Consider it the most appropriate place in a suitable area for the people where, where it's needed, right? Yeah. Enclosed, etc. There's a couple of enclosed because it'd be a, probably a million dollars to put a fence and there's also budget that has to come into this. Um, but let's just consider the most suitable places. I've listed a couple tonight. There's been a response that, as well. 
Um, doesn't mean we're all going to get parks everywhere. We're going to do go through the due diligence, find the budget, and then we'll go to council at, at, at an appropriate time. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Councillor Morrison. Now, uh, I put the motion. All those in favour, say aye. Aye. Against the, uh, myself. Clear it carried. Thank you so much. Now we're on to reports. Uh, number seven with the reports. Uh, we'll be dealing with CS22003, Bayside Community Grants Program 2021 2022. Uh, would the appropriate officer please uh, give us uh, just a, a summary of uh, this report? Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is Council's annual allocation of community grants for the financial year. This one year allocation, this is a one year allocation instead of the two that we normally do each year. And the reason for that is because there have been so many special rounds of COVID funding available to the community that we felt that the um, market had been a bit saturated, if you like, which was evidenced by the fact that we didn't receive as many applications as we normally would. Uh, small grant, this is for seeding grants <coughs> and small grants. Seeding grants aim to support innovative activities either never previously undertaken or not undertaken by us in Bayside. And the small grants are typically to support equipment purchases or small events, and they can be for people who have applied previously as well. So a total of 32 applications were received, 21 of which have been assessed by an independent evaluation panel um, comprising a representative from the Office of Local Government and a representative from Department of Community, Communities and Justice. So the 21 people have met the grant criteria and eligibility requirements. So Council's allocation for community grants is $100,000 per annum. As I mentioned, normally split into two allocations per financial year. And we have proposed $46,633 be recommended for funding and the unallocated funds potentially return to general revenue or put to other community use. So that's um, a, a general summary. The listing of the applicants and the assessments are contained within the report. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, now, uh, we have an officer's recommendation. Could I have a mover and a second? A move by Councillor Naji, seconded by Councillor Morrissey. Any discussion, councillors? Uh, Councillor Jensen. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's a, a grants program is a terrific program um, to be able to support the community. It's um, I think it's a great good news story, and it would be all, um, amazing to see this um, shared on Council's website. So I'm not sure if um, the grant recipients are posted on the Council website and there's any follow-up stories in regards to their projects. And um, the second part of my comment, I guess, was about um, whether there's any checking on their um, logo sign-off or their acknowledgement of Council, because um, it would also be terrific to see all of these community groups that are supported acknowledging that support. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Anson. Any other comments, Councillors? Councillor Musk? I was happy to do a response to Yeah. I was happy to do a response. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay. okay. Through you, Mr Chair, Councillor Jansen, we, we normally have a small function where we present the recipients of the grants with a with a cheque that they can take away. That's normally held before a council meeting so that they're acknowledged in that way. There's photography. We would then put uh, stories up on social media. And we also have a project in mind to follow those grants through to their fruition and develop a video capture of the kinds of things that they've achieved with that money. Thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion, Councillor? Oh, sorry, Douglas, Councillor Douglas. Um, a couple of questions. Um, the online events aren't part of this. Are they a separate 
agenda that we comes to council? A, a separate uh, conversation? But the I online think that's events? The next item. Sorry? I'm sorry. sorry. The online sorry. events sorry. like the Zoom and R's and stuff that we do, is that a separate? Uh, we, we have a council events update report oh, sorry. on the next item. That's yes, okay. this is great. Right. <laughs> That's okay. Happy to finalise the report anyway. Uh, any, uh, sorry, uh, Councillor. Yes, through the Chair, I'd like to ask, with the grants, do you have to have an ABN number to be eligible to apply for a grant? I'll just ask Rani, <laughs> Manager of Community <laughs> Life, to respond to that. Um, yeah, we normally require our grant recipients to be incorporated and to have an ABN to be eligible to receive funding. So can I just ask another question? If they haven't got an ABN but they are incorporated, are they considered eligible? Um, yes, we would consider, we consider all applications that come in. So whether they are from incorporated organisations, unincorporated organisations, individuals, and some, some applicants, if they're project is de deemed worthy, then we will ask that they, in order to be successful, they will need to find an auspice organisation. Right, thank you. Thank you, Rani. Okay, any other questions, councillors, discussion? If not, I'll put it all in favour, say aye. 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 Thank you. Those against, declare it carried. Um, still on reports, we've got um, report Item number CS22005, Council Events Update Report. Can we please have a summary on that from the appropriate officer? Who's giving a summary on that one? Christine? Or Gail? Kylie? Sorry. Manager of Events, did you want to give a couple of, say a couple of words about the report? Come to the lectern. <laughs> 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 Sorry, Keith. The, the microphone's just Thank you. Um, as you all know, the past couple of years have been very difficult for events. We haven't been able to hold any. So this report is coming up to you for consideration as we... Um, come out of COVID and move back into our normal events program. So we put together what we would normally do for the councillors to consider and um, determine which ones they would like to proceed with or if they would like to make other recommendations which we would take on board. Thank you, Ms. Stanford. So? Thank you, yeah. Okay, um, moved by Councillor Sedrak. Second by Councillor Jameson. Thanks, uh, Any discussion, councillors? Um, can I just quickly say thank you to the staff for putting this together? Um, it's amazing that after COVID, we've come back strong. There are some amazing events here. Um, and I want to thank the director as well as the staff involved. Um, I think Bayside's doing a, a great job, Mr. Chair, um, and in particular, um, the things that I'm really excited about is the Brighton Street Festival on the 14th and 15th <laughs> of May. Plug that. But also, also, I'm, I'm sure um, other councillors will be interested in the Ramadan Street Festival, which has been going on in Wall Street for a few years now, um, as well as uh, Councillor Morrissey's uh, Trees for Mum Mother's Day on the 7th of May. So there's some really good stuff. Um, and we get a lot of press... Uh, negative press, Bayside Council, for, you know, uh, what we're not doing. Um, I think, like uh, Councillor Jansen said, um, getting on the front foot and making this, um, and I know our Mayor, uh, Dr Christina Curry, has been really positive about getting the front foot in, in regards to um, social media, and we all have been trying to improve on that. I think it's the only way, really, to show the Bayside community that we're we're doing a, a, a quite a positive um, job rather than all the negative press we're getting. So well done to all and thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Sedrak. Councillor Jansen. I second Councillor Sedrak. Thank you uh, to the staff for pulling together a terrific events 
report. Just a couple of um, questions. Um, I was wondering how we um, scope for new events. So if there's any opportunities in the future for the community, I guess with a changing de demographic to um, be reflected in new events, um, being mindful of our budget, budget position. And secondly, I know that there's um, an event that the community in this area are still holding on to, which is the um, former botany gift slash bolt. So I'm wondering if we could um, potentially investigate some sort of hybrid of that. I know that the um, local public school successfully ran the bolt a few years ago um, to make up for the, the gift. I know also that there were long negotiations <coughs> with the body that um, produced the gift, but is this something, uh, some sort of hybrid event that we could investigate in the future on the calendar? I note that next year's calendar isn't there and that traditionally that event would occur January, I believe. Thank you, Mr. So Chair. Thank you, Councillor yeah. Jason. So you, you need an answer for the question. I respond to <laughs> whether we can actually um, add to the recommendation about so, yeah, investigating. Well, yeah. manager, I'm, I'm, happy to, I'm happy to speak to that through you, Mr. But, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, as far as the new event scoping is concerned, as, as the manager mentioned, we've really scrambled to try and pull together our events calendar, not knowing what we were dealing with from one day to the next. And uh, we had COVID, COVID yes. planned events, things that we said we could deliver during COVID that we had to move away from. So we put this calendar together, knowing that this is a calendar that we can deliver during these times. But we are very much looking forward to talking to the community about the type of events that they would like to see into the future, and particularly with reference to the changing demographics of the area, our, our cultural breakup, our, our age breakup, just the, the changing and shifting of the community. We want to be relevant to all members of the community in the events program. So that's certainly the approach we'll take next year. And as far as the botany gift bolt is concerned, that hasn't happened in my time, so that's how long it is since it, it has occurred. But um, I know that it was a very popular event and we'll certainly make sure that we include that in our scoping. Uh, th thank you for that. Uh, I think it was a yes. And I think uh, I'll get uh, <laughs> Councillor <laughs> Douglas here. Yeah. You, uh, you had a question on that. <coughs> item. Sure. Spoken. Sorry. Thank you. Um, just in terms of future events, I understand that this program is locked off for the year, but I did want to provide some feedback from what the community have been suggesting to me. Um, we had the very successful International Women's Day event that the Mayor hosted in Ramsgate, which um, really brought together women across Bayside. And we heard some amazing stories about how those women had broken through adversity. And so it was suggested to me that in the lead up to the next International Women's Day event, we hold uh, a series of online uh, workshops to enable women to hear from speakers about uh, breaking through the glass ceiling, basically, and how to overcome things like asking for a pay rise or those sorts of practical things that a lot of women don't get the opportunity. And that, that, that seedage of the event was limited. So, But they, there is a hunger in the community for those sorts of practical skills um, to overcome the gender pay gap. Um, I've also been asked to advocate for a busking festival at Dolls Point, uh, the beautiful parkland there, to have a daytime festival that enables different musical events to be happen happening simultaneously. <coughs> and I've been continually asked to advocate for music at the activation of the parks, like the one at uh, Lance Studdart Reserve that was going to happen this weekend and the one that was going to happen at the... West Botany Street uh, skate park to, because other um, park activations that they have in places like the City of Sydney include that. They have, they have a musical element and there's been musicians locally here who have uh, offered their services to that. Um, and the other thing I've been asked to advocate for is more of the Ramadan.
Bayside Council in particular in the use of utilising the town hall. And they've been really thrilled, especially from the Botany Group, to see it being used. So I want to acknowledge those people who have made that possible. And I mean, we use Rockdale Town Hall for our citizenship um, services and things, but it's brought something a bit more of a spark back into the um, botany people. So congratulations to that team. Thank you, Councillor Muscat. Any other discussion, Councillor? Councillor Warner? Thank you. Um, just a quick question through the chair. Um, I saw on the um, one of the events uh, on the list is the Botany Historical Trust AGM and a celebration. I think there's a sit down meal, and um, I was just wondering what would be the scope for having something similar uh, on this side of the airport. Um, I know there are, you know, similar organisations such as the St George Historical Society. So. Um, yeah, just wondering what, what the scope would be for having having that kind of a, an event on this side. Through you, Mr Chair. Certainly doable. We've been working with the Botany Historic Trust for a long time, but that's not to say that we can't have similar events with the, the St George equivalent of that organisation. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Warner. Uh, Councillor Naji. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, look, any council or any even residents that come up with an idea with an event that we think is special or it's uh, of importance, we're more than happy, <coughs> happy to consider it. But I just want to remind myself and other councillors, I need, we need to forget about that yeah. side and this side. We're talking about Bayside altogether. So when we have an event, it doesn't matter where it's held, as long as it's beneficial for whatever, uh, whether it's culturally, whether it's uh, socially, whether it, wh whatever the case may be, on its merit, we will consider it. So I don't want to, uh, me personally, I don't want to hear any more the West and the East or the other side and this side or, or the former Botany, former Rockdale. We are based on now. We've moved on so many years. So any event, Councillor Werner or anybody else, Councillor Douglas, and it's good to see Councillor Barlow at the back. I couldn't see you from the pole, and I see her knitting so well. Just to remind you, my size is extra large. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Morris. Thank you, Councillor Morris. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, I certainly agree. I think as councillors, we represent our community. So if anyone has ideas, they can approach councillors any time. I don't think we necessarily need this forum. Um, the events calendar is fluid and can be organised and reorganised. A plan's a plan, but, but that can change. Obviously, got to consider the budget and the, the doability of, uh, of these events. Um, the question I had, though, was in relation to the seniors Christmas party that's uh, invitation only, which is fine. I, I get that. Um, does that mean... And uh, It makes it awkward because you just said about this side and that side, but it's a Bayside <laughs> seniors Christmas party and we need a, we need a venue for it. So... Um, is there going to be uh, transport? How are we going to get people from one side to the other? Um, or um, are we going to alternate this year to year? Or what, how, how is that? Uh, yeah, what, what's the plan on that? Mm. For, for example, this is at Ramsgate RSL. I respect that, no problem whatsoever. But I'm sure there'd be some seniors here who don't drive. And we know yep. that thanks to the state government, the transport is absolutely woeful in this area. Um, we can't get from one side to the other. So. Uh, so, yeah, in the past we have organised a bus that comes from whichever side it's on to transport the seniors to the event. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Mm. And, and will that then be alternated to a different venue the following year? We could if that's what the councillors wish to do. That's, yeah, nothing is um, set in stone. Yeah, we, can, so, so. we can look at different venues, absolutely. Okay. Can I, on, on what Councillor Naji uh, mentioned, look, there's a lot of, uh, I, I fall into this trap as well, we usually use sides, um, that's one, and we usually, and I do this myself, I say the word I, 
and I think it'd be nice for all councillors to recognise that we make a decision as a team and that we as a council have made a decision, whether it be the dog park, whether it be the street festival, whatever it is, and we use that kind of language that we have done this together, that we have put this together. I know Councillor Morrissey was pushing the Mother's Day tree planting, but we as a council voted on that, and we as a council, hopefully on the 7th of May, will be there to represent our constituents. Yeah. So I think it's the... It's the let's, let's come back to the language of we, please. Yes, sure. And I'll be the first one to acknowledge that. Thank, thank you, Councillor Sidrak. Uh, now that discussions are over, a uh, motion moved by Councillor Sidrek, seconded by Councillor Jansen. Uh, all in favour say aye. Aye. Uh, declare it carried. Now we've already covered CS 22006 through public forum. We're on to CS 22004, draft public art policy. I'm not quite sure who's responsible for that. <laughs> Through, through you, Mr Chair. Um, this draft public art policy was developed to give policy clarity around public art installations across the LGA. Um, it replaces an earlier harmonised policy document that was developed post-amalgamation. So what that means is we took two previous policies and we harmonised them and developed one. This is an update to that policy. Um, the policy recognises that developers are increasingly looking to install art in the public domain and we're wanting guidance from council about what will and won't be acceptable. Likewise, there's an increasing demand from the community for visual art in the public realm. The policy is supported by implementation guidelines articulating how it will be operationalised day to day. So this policy was on public exhibition from the 14th of September to the 9th of January, so it was a very long exhibition period over the Christmas period last year. And it was presented to the February 22 meeting of council um, for adoption. The policy at that meeting was referred to this first city services committee at the request of Councillor Jansen, and so here we are for further consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, moved by Councillor Jansen, seconded by Councillor Morrissey. Any discussion, uh, Councillors? Uh, Councillor Jansen. Thank you um, for that summary um, through the chair. Um, I would, given that we've been talking a little bit about the budget position, um, I am mindful that the policy doesn't acknowledge um, loan work. So I think, um, along with um, acquisition of works which are donated, acquired or commissioned, we could consider a loan program as well, which um, is being more resourceful. So that's, uh, I noticed that one of the policy principles is about partnerships. So I think a good a strategic direction would be to enter into uh, loan partnerships to offset some of the costs. So that would offset your commissioning or full acquisitional costs. Um, I, I also feel that under 5.1 capital funding, um, we need to be a bit more of a leader in terms of um, public art. So the wording could be stronger in terms of council may decide to include public art. It could be council should scope public art as part of all its own major infrastructure projects that, you know, that may or may not mean that the public art um, proceeds, but I think that the language needs to be stronger to show a commitment to um, public art. Also under that capital funding um, section, I think it would be beneficial to potentially look at a um, <coughs> donations program for public art as well to offset the cost. So donations in terms of um, cash funding um, coming towards potential commissions um, in line with any kind of ICAC principles there may be around local government and sponsorships. And um, finally, I'd, and probably more um, 
slightly controversially, um, I, I would be suggesting that the Public Art Assessment Group has um, some form of councillor representation on it, so it's not just an internal subject matter group. Um, I think that councillors are very well attuned to their community and are representative of the community, and considering that public art is in particular site specific, I think it would be advantageous to have some councillor representation at that level. Why not? Oh, so I'd like to add that to um, the recommendation, if possible. Um, just in, just say the words, but you know what oh, sorry. I was talking to... To include, to, um, include councillor representation on the public art assessment group. Was I talking too fast about all the, the other things? There was also, in terms of the... Um, policy itself suggesting um, a loan program as well as looking at um, forms of cash <coughs> donations or sponsorships <coughs> towards um, commissions. And the rewording of 5.1. Oh, and the rewording of 5.1, the um, second paragraph, council may decide, council should scope public art. Also, the next line down in 5.1, taking out on occasion. I just think it, um, the change of the, that wording um, is a stronger commitment. Um, and just a question, aside from the Bayside um, Arts Festival itself, can you give me some kind of indication through you, Chair, what the annual program of public art has been, and that may include um, the mural program or any, any other form of public art. I'm not sort of up to date on the inventory or what assets we have. Uh, through you, Mr Chair. Um, some of the other things that Council has done has... We've had the camera art exhibition. It's a photography competition for residents to take photos of the surrounding yeah, area. I've won that a couple of times, I believe. <laughs> Sorry? Oh, I, have, oh, I have won that a couple of times. This is the chance. Oh. <laughs> prior, prior to being, me being a counsellor. So. Oh, this is real. This is real. This is real. <laughs> Um, the sculptures at Bayside and the Bayside Arts Festival as yeah. well. So I think um, we're in a period of kind of developing now um, a, new, a new arts program. I think that would be fair to say. So I think these sorts of conversations are quite useful in that context. Okay, thank you. So there, there hasn't been a regular mural or acquisitions or commissions program? Acquisition through the sculpture. Yep. Right, yeah. Yeah. So we've applied to. Yeah. Um, the loan borrowing last one. Oh, that the public art policy. Um, I wrote it down. If you want. I don't have the word yeah. for that one yet. Send it through to you shortly if you like. Okay, yep. well, while you do that, I, I'll, I'll get uh, Councillor Douglas yep. to address the council. Councillor Douglas, go ahead. Hi, thanks. Um, through the chair, I wanted to raise another recommendation to the 5.1 capital funding item um, to make it compulsory for all developments over a certain amount to be decided in the uh, to be decided by council. So to make it compulsory for all developments over a certain amount in the Bayside LGA to develop and implement a public art plan that gives back to the local community in the form of publicly accessible and engaging art. So this is a snippet from the Georges River Council policy. Under modified provisions in the development control plans, for the major centres of Cogra, Hurstville and Riverwood, all new developments have a development cost value. Having a development cost value of more than $5 million must develop and implement a public art plan 
a minimum of 1% of the total cost of the development is to be allocated to the public art budget. So basically what that means is if it's a development over $5 million, then a small percentage, which is 1% of that development, has to go towards public art for Bayside residents. That's my recommendation. So I, are you adding that to the officer's recommendation? Sorry? Are you adding that to the recommendation? Yeah. Of okay. Would um, the mover and the seconder, I think we've got Councillor Jensen and Boris here, did you want to? We haven't got it up there, so can, can you actually, sorry, repeat that? Chair, Chair could I? Sorry, sorry to go on, uh, but, uh, GM. Um, what would be required around the wording there would be that council investigate the feasibility of including these provisions in the DCP or in the council policy, rather than trying to put it into policy now sure. from the floor. We yep. need to be able to go um, and properly analyse what we could legally enforce. There have been some issues with some councils True. having this in their DCPs. Sure. So we just want to be sure that when, if we were recommending something back to council, it could be implemented. Makes sense. Yes. Well, is this more of a planning, planning matter? Through, through the Institute. Sorry. Uh, I thought any development, doesn't matter how small or how medium or how large, that is a contribution that the already, whether the mums and dads developing their home or the major developers or whatever, there, there's a certain criteria and a percentage that it's got to go to contribution. So is this going to be an add-on uh, contribution? Well, a, yeah. On a percentage? I mean, that's, yeah, but, but that, the GM but, is right. We need to... Uh, investigate and see uh, how, if we're going to implement it, and, and what are the cons and. So, should we add that, uh, Meredith, to to the recommendation in order to. Yeah. It's not months and days. No, no, no. But still, it would have to be, it has to go through the plan. But wouldn't this not be in the public art policy? This is more to do with planning. And would this be the planning committee? I think we can, with the wording that's been incorporated there, that council investigate where we bring that back, which committee we bring the it back to. The planning It could come back to planning, it could come back to services, but we do need to fully investigate. So before it becomes before policy. Be so you send it to the planning okay. committee. Okay, sorry. So what, what's been added to there, I can't actually see it. Is that the right wording, uh, GM? Yes. Yes. That's fine. It is. Okay. Uh, the mover and second. Are you happy with that? Yep. Sure. Okay. Right of reply. Uh, uh, just a uh, sorry. The right of a quick one. Sorry, Councillor Jensen. Can I just ask a question? Um, and before I do, I, I've also there's been a lot of positive feedback in regards to Bayside's um, art and design, and um, I just have this question um, in particular. One site that comes to mind is in Dulls Point, the toilet that we uh, renovated there not many years ago through you, Chair. Um, we've put an art mural there and there has been a lot of positive feedback about that art that is being put on the outside of a toilet of all places. And there's been, um, and I know our friends at Georgia River have always um, looked upon Bayside envious that we have, believe it or not, our toilets, uh, especially of late, of late, not our previous ones down on the foreshore, but of late have been quite positive in design, number one, and number two, some of this artistic nature have been quite positive as well. So my question is, um, when we have future uh, developments such mm -hmm. as parks, such as toilets, such as what, whatever it may be, can we also add in there some kind of artistic flair that could be put up on these? I mean, no one wants to see a back of a toilet, you know, where people are graffitiing. But if it's got a beautiful uh, Waratah or whatever it may be, ghetto style. I know, Councillor Curry, you like the ghetto style. Whatever it may be, 
whatever it may be, can we incorporate that in our in our design? And we might go to the to um, a design competition, and we might say, okay, all the they have to be local artists. Let's say, for example, um, and they then enter a competition. They draw it up, and we put it on the back of the toilet. Is there potentially something that we could add to this, Councillor Morris? Are you not too fond of this idea, Councillor James? Councillor Cedric, can I um, answer? I think that council assets such as toilets are really, really important council assets and can be beautified um, and as a writer re reply I'd like to um, suggest that the committee recommendation looks at and investigates um, a mural art program and scopes that mural program as well for the next um, financial year and Beautiful. beyond. Um, Thank you. Okay. Great suggestion. So I could see that's been added to there so that that brings us to the close of discussion and we have a motion. All in favour say aye. 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 Yes. Declare it carried. So basically that brings us to the end of the uh, agenda items. Um, no confidential reports. So um, being further no items, I declare the meeting closed at uh, 7.45. Thank you. Uh, sorry, 7.41. Thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, everyone, for your
Thanks, Chair. Um, this report is advising Council that the State Government has announced, in particular the Minister, a review of the approved rate peg. So I part set the rate peg at 1.6 back in December with a base rate peg of 0.7 and a growth factor of 0.9 for Bayside Council. The long-term average that Council did its long-term financial planning on was 2.5% and the Minister has announced the ability for a amended rate, vary, rate peg for 2.5% that we have to um, put to Council and process that through IPART for an independent review. The report actually indicates that we're putting it to this committee for the committee's advice and I'm also informing com the committee that we'll be having a budget workshop on the 20th of April We'll be going through the budget in detail and the, the scenarios that Council will be modelling as an outcome of this report. Thank you, um, Mr Wong. Is there a mover and a seconder for that? Move, moved by uh, Councillor Werner, seconded by Councillor Fardell. 
Is there any any discussion? Councillor Warner? Yeah. Um, I would like to congratulate the um, local government sector and also this council for um, for advocating on behalf of local councils because um, this uh, IPART determination of the 0.7% uh, rate peg really um, was uh, quite difficult for councils to take. So it's it's. I, I was at the um, local government conference when um, you know we were advocating to the the uh, local government minister that this really um, needed to be looked at. So it looks like um, that this has been the you know concerns have been taken into account, and it's really great that there's an opportunity to make a submission for the 2.5% that we were expecting. So just want to thank council staff and, um, you know, for, for <coughs> making this submission to the government. Thank you, Councillor Warner. Is there any other dis questions, discussion? Silence is golden. There, no, there be no further discussion. I put the recommendation on the screen. Moved by Councillors Werner and Fardell. All those in favour of the motion say aye. aye. All those in favour uh, against say against. I declare the motion carried. Thank you. Uh, moving on to the next agenda item, CP22.002, review of the fees to the independent members of the Audit and Risk Committee. Is there a mover? Oh, is there a um, anyone speaking to that from Council, Council Officer, before we start? Through you. Um, Thank you. Mr Chair. Um, I'd just uh, the report just seeks a uh, review of the fees we pay to the independent uh, members of the Risk and Audit Committee. Uh, as you would be aware, we uh, finalised an expression of interest uh, process and were able to attract uh, some uh, highly qualified and experienced um, members to the committee. Uh, during that process, there was considerable uh, discussion around the, the fees that were being paid. Our fees were set uh, fairly low uh, back in 2017 um, and we gave an undertaking that we would re <coughs> review those, um, taking into account the uh, draft guidelines um, issued by the uh, Office of Local Government. Uh, we've done a comparison um, of those guidelines, which aren't formalised yet, uh, with some neighbouring councils. Um, I expect that uh, uh, we're probably one of the first off the rank to review our fees. Um, and we've also looked at what we uh, pay to um, our independent members on the local planning uh, panel to provide some sort of benchmarking. And I think uh, that would probably provide the council with, with the most reliable comparison uh, at this stage uh, as to what the um, what we should be paying those uh, expert members. And uh, that is what's been recommended to you. Thank you for the summary, Mr. Sir. Um, Councillor Fidel? Oh, sorry, I didn't get a mover. You're moving that? Yes, and a seconder. Moved by Councillor Fidel, seconded by Councillor Curry. I just Councillor wanted to Fidel. say that, um, as you did, Scott, we attended the meeting and we met in person the experts. And um, these are very impressive people, very experienced people, have a lot of life experience, a lot of experience in the financial sector. Um, if we want to continue to attract those sort of people, we need to be realistic about the fees that uh, they should receive. So uh, I certainly support this and I'd also just like to say too that the staff were very impressive during the meeting too. They were so um, so well informed and so um, engaging. It was really, a, a, it was uh, very interesting, the first meeting. So uh, I certainly support that um, the, we review the fees. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Cedrak. Through you, Mr Chair. I, I've just got a question. Uh, thank you, um, Mr Soot, for this information and this report. Um, just a question. In regards to the comparison fees for members per meeting, 
by other councils compared to us. Um, you said that they were due for review as well. When do, so what I'm trying to ascertain is we've come off with this amount. Do you think that um, the fees for members from other councils will, I'm assuming, go up as well? So is this still a conservative amount bearing that in mind? I, uh, if you have a look at the, the first point is we've only taken the uh, comparisons from what's publicly available. Um, if uh, counts, if uh, other councils looked at our fees, all they would see is the 750. Yeah. I imagine that's what's happening at the moment. Um, we've had regard to the draft guidelines, um, and it's um, they have placed it in categories, so um, we are uh, comparable to, to that. Uh, so I think um, going forward uh, and just based on those guidelines and based what the government has uh, dictated for the local planning panel will we'll be in, within the ball park. So you still think it's a good... Sorry, through you, Mr Chair. So you think it's a good... Uh, a good area to be in, that, that fee overall, in your opinion? Yes, I do. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other speakers? Councillor Wenham. Um, I support this as well. I've just got a question, and also I think members of the public would like to know uh, what kind of duties the um, members of the panel have. Like, do they... Obviously, they're not going through all the, um, you know, council finances because they're not the actual auditors. But just if you could give a general idea of the... Of a bit more detail as to what the panel members... what kinds of things they do. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, through the chair, um, the uh, independent members take on uh, quite considerable responsibility in terms of... Uh, the Charter. Um, uh, practically, uh, they uh, review uh, the reports that uh, we provide them and uh, they're quite uh, uh, extensive uh, and in-depth. And then they put their professional mind to the matters, uh, raise questions, uh, put forward suggestions. Uh, the current panel uh, has also indicated their willingness to a look at drafts um, in their own time, um, uh, be able to provide us with um, uh, their insights that they've got from other panels that, that we can use to uh, improve our processes. So they're um, given their level of experience, not just in uh, with local government, but state and federal, uh, that would become invaluable. And uh, if you were there on... Um, at the last meeting, um, some of that was already coming through. The chair will take a much uh, uh, greater responsibility um, in terms of ensuring that the um, work plan is put into place um, and has a, a greater responsibility in um, ensuring there's cohesion amongst the, uh, the members and with the, the staff. Thank you, Mr. Sir. Is there any further discussion? Sorry, I just took a mouthful. I didn't tell us more. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd certainly just uh, in, in to, to respond to a couple of things there, um, Councillor Fardell raised. The, this um, this increased fee is um, will hopefully um, attract and retain really good talent on our independent audit and risk. Um, committee members and personally I see it as a is a um, absolute investment in the council for a relatively um, small relatively small cost and uh, all councillors as we've talked about uh, in previous meetings all councillors are welcome to attend those meetings um, as, as an observer there is quite some of it is quite dry absolutely uh, it is but uh, a lot of it is very insightful and there's a lot to a lot to get through and that will influence down council it can influence Council's strategic directions with our internal auditors and um, business improvement team. 
So um, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'll be supporting this motion as well. So there, no, <clears throat> there being no further discussion, I put the recommendations on the screen. Moved and seconded by councillors Fidel and Curry. All those in favour of the motion say aye. aye. All those against say against. I declare the motion carried. Moving on to the next item, CP22003. Um, before we commence, uh, I just want to highlight that there is a confidential attachment that relates to this item. So if there is any discussion that is, uh, relates to that confidential item, we will have to close the session. Um, if there's nothing related to it, we'll proceed. So we'll see how we go on that. Um, is there a, a councillor offer who wishes to speak to that? Thank you. Joseph Banks Adventure Playground um, is funded uh, by the Legacy Grant. We were successful <coughs> in that funding last year. There is also Section 711 funding through development contributions and Community Environmental Projects Reserve, which provides for increasing tree canopy within the playground as well. So the play space is designed primarily for ages 2 to 12. Um, it's the theme of an adventure play space in a natural setting and we've used the natural um, hills and the, the form of the, the park <coughs> to really accentuate the, the use of that, that playground. Um, the landscaping primarily comprises locally indigenous species and we've based the playground design around accessibility and inclusiveness. So we're bringing to you tonight um, the outcomes of the tender process. The tender opened um, on the 8th of February, closed on the 8th of March, and six submissions were received. We're proposing the um, acceptance of the tender from Glascott Landscape and Civil for an amount of $2.68 million, and that is covered by the funding as detailed. Thank you. Um, this item uh, is now open. Moved by Councillor Curry. I'll second that um, as the Ward Councillor. Is there any discussion? Councillor Curry? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, this is a really exciting project at, that the community are extremely excited about and uh, will just be a really good asset to um, Sir Joseph Banks Park and I think will be a real attraction <coughs> for um, many children. And um, so I think the um, there was quite a bit of work done to get the grants so, um, and, and the planning and everything, which is a great outcome and it, and it shows um, the capacity of council to um, you know, get those types of um, grants, which are very competitive, and then also to put forward um, an amazing asset that um, will be enjoyed for many, many years to come. So thank you to everyone who has put a lot of time and energy into that project. Thank you, Councillor Curry. Anyway, Councillor Werner. Um, I'd also like to congratulate staff, and I think the design is lovely. Um, when, when I saw the, the drawings, uh, I, I was really excited. I think it looks beautiful, and um, so yeah, thank you to the staff. Councillor Cedric. Through you, Mr Chair, can I, I've just got a quick question. Um, obviously weather dependent, what is the <coughs> estimated completion time? So uh, construction will commence in May if endorsed at the council meeting and would be complete in December. We have spoken to Legacy Grant about any delays and they are open to that considering any inclement weather that we're experiencing at the moment. But we're on target for, for December. And sorry again through you, Mr Chair. So if there is a delay, I know weather is quite difficult now to judge. Is there a, um, any, usually with these kind of deals, is there a clause that if they go over time, is there some kind of penalty or compensation? We have delay costs within the contract. However, they are able to claim wet weather extensions of time. <coughs> Okay, thank you. Is there any other speakers from the floor? No? Um, just, just from my perspective, um, again, it's, it's going to be an, an amazing, uh, an amazing <coughs> play space. Just um, a, a couple of things, though, that I think we'll face future challenges with is the parking there. The, uh, the parking at the end of Friendland Street 
is at maximum capacity already on a, on a business as usual Sunday in summer or spring. Um, so we might want to just initially put some signage around the other car parking options available, which could be the golf course uh, car park, it could be the Tupia Street car park, it could be actually the boat ramp because there's a bridge directly across that. So just an education uh, signage, no, not interpretive signage, um, but <laughs> education to say more parking available. Uh, interpretive, isn't it? Okay. More, more, more parking available. There's going to be interpretive signage thank you, here. Thank you. Um, and, and within that, and it doesn't have to be in this motion, just to consider the future parking needs of that, um, of that area because it will, in, it will start to impact residents um, close by. And with full disclosure, I'm one of those residents. Um, but it has been a concern raised by people uh, in, my, in my community. There was some talk uh, in, the, in the motion, uh, sorry, in the, in the paper around if there's extra funding to include additional fencing. Um, my view on additional fencing around the pond is that it's a waste of money. It's not going to, you know, it's not a dog park pool type fencing. It's just sort of something very country style and I think the money could be invested elsewhere. Um, rather, you know, fencing is quite expensive. Um, you know, we've got a motion on board for the, the pump track. We've got some funding coming in, hopefully for that, in a year or two or three, who knows? But in, in the interim, it could be additional parking. It could be a basketball court down there. It could be something else for older kids as well, as opposed to... So I'd really, before I just ask council officers if, if there is additional funding that you please seek guidance from council uh, councillors before, and even on an informal basis, just to seek to some direction and then pass, you know, put that through as a motion if it if it's required at the time and it can't be handled administratively. Um, anyway, um, Councillor Curry, write a reply. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I just had a thought to, um, at some point in the near future, and I'm not suggesting in the next budget, but we um, will have to turn our minds to the, the amenity block. Mm -hmm. It is... Um, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's not very pleasant. Uh, so if council could look at opportunities um, for... And look, um, it may not... Ne it may just require a cosmetic upgrade yeah, um, to modernise it with a mural. <laughs> and... <laughs> so, so if we could just... Um, yeah, flag that, um, and there may be some future funding opportunities as well that will um, yeah. contribute to what is becoming the Sir Joseph Banks Master Plan. Thank you. There being no further discussion, I'll put the recommendations on the screen. Moved by Councillor Martha Curry and myself. <laughs> All those in favour of the motion say aye. 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 Against. Against. Final report uh, for tonight is CP22.004, Council Superannuation. Have we got a Council Office for uh, Through you, um, Mr Chair. The, uh, the Government um, went through an extensive consultation period with uh, the industry on whether or not uh, councillors should be paid superannuation. Uh, the end result uh, was changes to the Local Government Act, uh, which come into effect from the 1st of July this year. The, uh, the Act allows Council, by resolution, uh, to pay its councillors the uh, relevant uh, superannuation contributions. Um, it's discretionary, so a council may resolve to do so or may do nothing and uh, no payments are made. Importantly, even if a council resolves to uh, make the contributions, individual councillors can decide not to uh, receive the payment or um, reduce the amount of payment it receives. So the matter is uh, for firstly for the committee and then council. Uh, the recommendation is framed uh, in a way that you need to determine which way you uh, want to recommend to the committee, whether you make the contributions payable available or not.
Thank you, uh, Mrs. Su. I have a mover for this item. Councillor Werner, second. Councillor Fidel. Can I just make, uh, sorry to interrupt. Yep. The rec um, you will need to decide whether to, uh, whether or not yeah, to going. resolve. So which way you want to go. Okay, so do you want that up? Do you want that up front so well, we can speak to it? Yes. The mover. So, Councillor Werner, you've moved it. You need to say you want to put, uh, make a decision to support Councillor Superannuation or not. Okay. Uh, well, I would, uh, I would say it's a good idea. Support. Uh, I would support it. Um, okay, so just. So what? So what? So what we're going to say is we're going to word the. It's a recommendation, so we have to move take, change that into a motion. So the rec the recommendation will be that council supports the payment of superannuation to councillors. So that if you want to, let's let's make that the motion. Hold on, we'll just let them catch up. Okay. Okay, thank you. So, yeah, Councillor Werner, up yeah, to, sorry, to you. Um, I think there's a lot of good reasons why uh, we should have superannuation. One of them is that without it, it really does make council, you know, this kind of work, because it, it, it can be a lot of work. And if, if, <laughs> if superannuation isn't paid, it really discourages people who... Um, <coughs> you know, or already have a lot of other work. So uh, by doing this work, uh, you know, some, some people are able to, um, uh, how to put it, but really, uh, it, it really helps people who do not have high incomes to become councillors as well. And I think that that's really a, um, a progressive thing for council to do. Uh, the other thing is that it encourages women to be councillors as well, because um, as we know, women have a lower uh, superannuation uh, that um, amount, um, often because of you know taking time off to look after children and and uh, also because of the pay gap. So I think paying superannuation would help to address that as well. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Curry. Thank you, Chair. Can I just ask, what, um, with the 15 councillors, what would that cost council per annum? Um, through uh, you, Mr Chair, the, um, on the current rates, the, the uh, payment will be approximately $58,000 uh, per annum. Can I ask a question on behalf of Councillor Savranoski, who's not here at the moment? Can this superannuation be back paid? <laughs> <laughs> Is that rhetorical? Uh, it's, uh, I don't think we need an answer to that. Because he's 30 years. Like. <laughs> uh, for the um, public record, it starts on the 1st of July with no back payments. <laughs> Thank you. Um, from 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 my perspective, I reading through the report, it's a, it's optional. So councillors have the option if they do not wish to take a superannuation payment, it's an opt out. If we if we uh, if this is uh, successful, then it will turn into an opt out, which means all councillors will be entitled to the superannuation payments as part of the, the fees. Uh, that said, if anyone wishes to opt out, they have the option to do so, uh, and. Uh, all, everything is recorded in the annual reports, as we know. So it's, uh, it's really up. Ultimately, while we're, we're making this uh, available to councillors, uh, and if anyone wishes to opt out, they can, they can do so um, for their individual um, requirements or needs or conscience or whatever. So, so any further to anyone else uh, wishes to speak? Okay, would you like a right of reply, Councillor Werner? Um. 
So there being no further discussion, I put the recommendations on the screen, which uh, just for the record recommends that the superannuation contribution payments be paid to councillors and the mayor as, amount, um, as per the amount council would be required to contribute under the Commonwealth Superannuation Guarantee Administration Act. All those in favour of the motion say aye. Aye. All those against say no. I declare it carried. Can I just add something, sorry, Chair? And um, the option is also councillors can elect to donate it to a charity too. It's mm. correct, as, as you can do with, your, with any fees. Okay. Um, there was no confidential session, so uh, we can. Is, there's no, no further items. No, we're all done. I therefore declare the meeting closed at 8:22 p.m. Thank you. Well done. Wait.